Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Bitoku from Devere Games. Bitoku and the expansion rest of the term, that is, I'll be covering both of these today, and I'll have timestamps down below, but I'm going to dive into a general overview, but certainly not a teach of Bitoku, my general thoughts of it, what the expansion adds, all of that, links and timestamps to everything, or more timestamps than links to everything down below. Bitoku is a medium weight Euro game that I'm not going to try to heavily explain to you. Normally in my reviews I try to go through enough information that you understand exactly what's happening here. I, I can't do that easily over here without without turning this into a full rules teach. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. I will note before we dive into the full review that you might sense a degree of hesitancy on my part. I And because of that I think I'm going to go a bit into opinions so we can approach this the right way. I think Potoku is incredibly clever and can be incredibly satisfying, but I also think there's a lot going on here that takes a little bit away from the experience. But with that, let's go ahead and talk about it. Bitoku is a medium in weight Euro game for one to four players, a game which you're going to be trying to do a ton of different things to get points, but the core concept is there are four rounds of play, and in each round of play there are three main actions you're going to be taking. You are either going to be taking one of these cards over here. These are the yokai cards. I think they're the yokai cards. There's a lot of terminology in the game, but these are the yokai cards over here. You're going to be taking these cards. You're going to be playing them for whatever the action is on the bottom of the card. Now, there's a lot of information. There's the type of card. This is the starting benefit. This is going to be the points you can cash it in for, and that's going to be the action. And there's a ton of symbology in the game. So forget for a second what the cards do. Just understand that on my turn, I can go ahead and play this to my board over here, to my personal player board, and I can take the action on the card, whatever that action might be be. That is one of the three main actions you're going to do across the course of the game. Now, there's a lot of things you're trying to and a lot of reasons why you'll do that, but some of the starting benefits are going to be things like gaining resources, gaining either of these tokens over here. These tokens over here are going to be cards. For example, over here, this card. This card lets you gain from this pile or from this pile. These will give you resources right away. These will give you resources when they nicely pair up together with those tokens over there. There's a whole bunch of other reasons you want those tokens, but tokens good. That's the general idea. Tokens are good. They're going to help you score points, get resources, do a variety of things in the game, playing a card will help you get some of those resources. There's also going to be the other side of these bonuses over here. These tokens over here are various crystals that can go on your player board to help build out your engine. They're going to free some of these pilgrim tokens to be able to use them for other purposes. So every time you build a crystal, you're not just getting an ongoing benefit, either income every single round, or a triggered benefit when you place a card, or alternatively, a if you do this, then get that kind of benefit. So every time you got a new yokai card, get two points, that kind of thing. So they're all going to be beneficial in their own right, but when you take one of these, you will put it onto your board, you'll awaken a pilgrim, the spot you put it on is going to be worth two points, and now you can use that pilgrim for a variety of possible uses in the game. A variety of possible uses in the game. That's going to be the general idea of playing cards. So you place a card, and you're going to go ahead and take that action. Now, there are five starting cards you're going to have. One of them we just covered. It's going to be relevant to these two piles. The other one over here is going to be relevant to these two piles. So you get to do one of these two things. This one gives you a movement, and there's two ways to spend movement. Let's ignore that for right now, but there are ways to gain movement and get points out of it. And then over here, these are going to be the different types of resources, the four different types of resources, and it's an either-or. Those are going to be the starting cards you have, and again, one of the actions you'll take every single round is playing a card. More specifically, you're going to do three card plays every single round across four rounds of, it, four rounds of play. That means you're going to be playing a total of 12 cards in the game. That's action one. The second action you do, and it actually nicely chains together, is whenever you place a card, you unlock the die next to that card. That's going to be true across your player board. You'll start with three, two, and one, and you'll have the ability to upgrade those dice throughout the course of play, but you'll unlock that die, and now you can go ahead and spend that die by placing it onto the board. Again, the board can be a lot overwhelming. The lowest section of the board over here is going to be those bonuses related to those cards. Over here, we have some worker placement, and over here, we have some bonuses you can earn, and over here, we have one of the places you can earn the footprints by moving along those pathways to get various perks. Second action you can take involves placing the die onto one of the worker placement spots. Now at the beginning of the game, you have to do that sequentially. First you have to play a card, that will unlock a die, then you can place the die, then you can cross the river with the die for a third possible action. As you go throughout the course of the game, there are more ways to unlock dice that will help you so you can actually take a dice placement first, which can be important, especially if you're vying for certain things, because getting there early is a big part of the game, and so either going through the regular procedure of playing card, unlock a die can be useful, but so can just unlocking a die through a variety of possible bonus 
bonuses in the game, which again, not getting into all of it. Once you have a die over here, let's go ahead and take this one. Now this one is not that helpful on its own, so let's pretend, I'm not really pretend, we start the game with one of these, let's cast this in to go ahead and turn it into a two. Those tokens throughout the course of the game are going to allow you to upgrade your dice, to take your dice higher, so earning those bonuses is a good thing. That's where you can look at, let's say, one of these fireflies over here and see that dragonflies, and see that this dragonfly, when paired, will give you that token. So again, those tokens can be used to trade in a die to raise this value by one, two, or three. We're going to take this two now, and we're going to place it into one of the four primary worker placement zones. There's additional worker placement spots you can go up here. More often than not, you're going to be going to some of these zones over here. And over here, let's cover what these do. This one over here, when we place the die over here, it's a strength two, which means we look at the two, that lets us build one of these two. So again, this worker placement zone corresponds again to these. You can build these through cards, but also through placing a worker. The higher tiers will give you discounts, more flexibility, all the way up to a six, which will let you do both of them in a single die action. And additionally, you can activate a building. When you place a die into any of these zones, if your die value is equal or higher than a building there, you can go ahead and activate that. Look at this, this one will actually let us unlock a die, so we can unlock a die a little earlier than we otherwise would be able to. This spot over here is going to be movement. Again, movement we haven't heavily gotten into, but there's a whole sector up here where you can start placing your pilgrims on the board and advance them along this track. This spot over here is going to be again related to the buildings and the crystals that you can have over here. And then lastly over here, we're going to have resource generation. So those are the four core worker placement spots. Here's a bit of a catch-all and also affects turn order as you go. Now there's a whole aspect over here of how some things tie together. We're not really getting into the uh, Ikaru tiles over here. We're not really getting into some of these charts over here of these various ways you're going to be moving your tokens up this track to get various benefits. We're trying to keep it a little bit more straightforward so you can understand the game. And then the third possible action, or more specifically to understand the game in a uh, not full to rules teach. The third possible action, which once you've placed your die, is you can cross the river with a die. When you cross the river, you lower the die by one, unless it's a six, in which case you lower two or three. You cross the, the river, you lower the die by one, and you take one of the benefits from these spots over here, which often involve gathering more yokai cards, more Batoku cards, or getting a variety of various perk bonuses over here. And so you get to choose those by looking at the cards and how they'll fit into your engine. Your starting cards are okay, but the yokai cards you can buy throughout the course of the game are better. Batoku cards are important because it's the other way you can earn footprints. A Batoku card is going to chain off your player board, creating a nice little pathway where you can start moving along the, the, the various uh, Batoku cards in order to get the perks on them, as well as getting endgame scoring for having a variety of different types of those cards in your little map that you're building. So there's a few ways to spend those movement points, either up top of the, of the board in order to get a variety of bonuses there, or alternatively for those Batoku cards. That's kind of where I'm going to tap out of trying to teach the game, because I think that gives you enough of a general overview of what's going on. A few more things, let's talk about actually this over here. These cards are cards you can earn that will give you a variety of ways to earn points if you've achieved certain things across the course of the game. One of them might not seem like much, maybe you get four or six points, but if you have five or six of them, you can be getting a chunk of your overall points from those cards if you manage those well. And so again, across four rounds of play, you're going through a sequence. You're going to be placing a card to unlock dice. You're going to be placing those unlocked dice onto various worker placement sports spots on the board. You're going to take those dice and try to cross the river to get more action and in general across the course of a round you're going to be taking somewhere between three to uh well more than three you're taking a minimum of six actions ideally possibly as much as eight or nine actions in a round across four rounds of play and then some of your points to see who did better across a whole bunch of different ways that things score that is basically Batoku. now the expansion is going to add a few things but we'll talk more about the expansion you know what, let's talk more about expansion at the end of this. We're going to save the expansion for the end. Let's dive first into my overall opinions of Otoku. This is a game I have played both with and without the expansion. I had a variety of player counts, and I have both a lot of positive and a lot of medium things to say about the game. Speaking from a positivity standpoint, or starting off with the things I like in the game, the game is incredibly intricately connected in a way that results in a very satisfying experience once you understand what's going on here. And there is a lot to understand. This is a game where you're going to be taught the game. Ideally, you're taught the game. Ideally, you're not reading from the rulebook. The rulebook could be much better. The way they spread out information makes this a much harder, longer teach if you're going by the rulebook than if you have someone teach you the game directly. But once you're taught the game, once you understand how to dive into it, you're going to have a lot of pieces of disparate information, a lot of understanding of how things work together. And again, this is skipping a a lot of the details over here. It's a very light teach for a reason. But once you have those pieces of information, you're going to start taking turns and you will feel lost at first. There's so many things chiming together in different ways that they're going to start to make sense as you start getting into maybe even your first round of play is done and move on to round two and you're like, 
it's starting to make sense now. Now I understand why I should place the building over there. Now I understand the control benefits of the building. Now I understand why to cash in that card for extra points and take it out of the board entirely. There's a ton of things you're doing in the game and they all come together to give you various pathways of how to sequence things together in ways that can be incredibly satisfying. Building up a giant path of Batoku cards to be able to move across, gaining bonus after bonus is incredibly rewarding. Moving all the way along the top track of the board with your movement there instead, also incredibly rewarding. You can even go do a little bit of both if you're willing to specialize and focus. Building up a whole swarm of butterflies and uh, dragonflies, a, sp a swarm of dragonflies and the little spirit tokens over there, getting a little pairings and, and just chaining those off each other can be incredibly rewarding. Getting a bunch of your Karu rocks over here, putting a Karu rocks into your garden and then putting your various pilgrims around them in order to score a bunch of points. Again, you can get 30, 40 points from that if you optimize it hard. Chasing certain pathways in this game can pay off well for you, and you have to kind of see the pattern of not just how the board's laid out, not just what the starting tiles are. These are cargo tiles over here are going to be incredibly important for ways you can score extra points, and we didn't even teach about them. You're going to be looking at the various ways you can get extra points on these various tracks as you invest into the buildings, into the positioning, into the rewards you get. There's a lot of chaining going on in the game, and it's just an incredibly satisfying sequence of play a card, unlock a die, place a die, cross the river, earn bonuses, earn new cards, earn more Batoku cards, get more cards for the various bonuses you'll get. You're just going to find that this is a game, your first game of Batoku, you may well score 100 points. If you play it well, maybe you score 100 points in your first play of Batoku. But by the time you get your third or fourth play, you might be getting closer to that 200 point mark. And that difference, that difference of how you're able to move from nearly doubling your score by understanding the game system is incredibly rewarding. And there's a nice little push your luck system at play over here in terms of the unlocking dice versus the just going through the natural sequence, because these benefits are key to your engine. Getting the right benefits that tie in nicely to what you're doing, that will be the difference between getting 130 and 160 points. And so trying to optimize around getting the right rewards at the right time is important, but that means you're playing a little bit of a game of unlocking dice. Because unlocking dice is a reward you can earn in the game, but it's a reward you have to try to pay into to earn. And so you're, you're torn between, do I just go through the natural sequence of things and try to earn other things instead? The other hand, having that flexibility is good. It gets me ahead of my opponent so that by the time they're slowly unlocking things, I'm already placing and potentially even getting an extra full bonus action over my opponents. Because if you can cross the river more often than they can, that's a difference of two full actions from your opponents. And especially at lower player counts, that's just a huge difference in how well you're doing. And so your scores Will get better as you play. The sequencing is incredibly there. The opportunity, the amount of opportunity for where you can find your bundles of points. Again, in a in a point in a game that goes to 150 points, you're looking at a bunch of points you'll earn throughout the game. Maybe 40, 60 points you'll earn throughout the game, but a lot of end game points. And so finding your pathways. Look at that. I scored 22 points for my Batoku cards. I scored 40 points for my various bonus cards and all the things I did there because there's just so much you can do, and it's it's very rewarding and it all flows together beautifully. And that's a whole lot of positivity because there's also things I don't like about the experience. And the main thing I don't like really comes down to one core concept just explained in five different ways, which is there's just too much going on here. There's too much going on in Batoku in a way that makes it a game that I both incredibly appreciate while not a game I'm in a rush to table as much because there's there's too much. There's too much rules. There's too much components. There's too much setup. There's too much teardown. There's too much rules teeth. There's just too much going on in the board. This is a beautiful board. It is the whole thing, everything, the art, components, all that stuff is beautiful, but it's also messy. The trying to get players into this game from the beginning is just so overwhelming. I'm like, ignore everything you see. These are the only four spots you care about. Everything else just completely ignore. It is over overwhelming. Batoku is full of overwhelming in so many different ways. The board is not intuitive to actually understand, teach, and process, and it's visually cluttered and just way too much. The rules, I mean, this is that, where's the play? I don't even have the play rate. The play rate for this game is obscene. It's like a full two-page hand spread with a tons of iconography, and it's not even all the iconography. There are pieces of iconography that are even missing from this full four-page spread, like two pages back-to-back, -back, all that stuff. It's a four-page spread of iconography, of rules, of sequences, of explaining where the board is. Teaching players this game, it is not, it is not an incredibly heavy game. It is medium weight heavy to the point that it is a satisfying experience without being brain burnery. But the initial mental load, the initial mental cognitive load of trying to understand everything going on, it's just too much. There's a lot going on in this game and the game does work well, but getting people up and running initially, this is not a game I'm excited to teach new players. This is not a game I'm excited to show new players. When I find games that blend beautifully, sometimes I'm just, I just can't wait. I want to introduce you to something intricate, something cool, to something amazing. The last new person I taught Patoku to, I told them, I was like, it's satisfying. It's like, this is a person in my game group, and I was like, it's, it's a good game. It's satisfying. If you want to play it, I think you'll enjoy it. 
but it's also a lot. And we did play it, we did have a good time, it was a fun experience, but again, that aspect of, I'm not excited to teach Potoku, I am reluctant to teach it, and yes, by the time all is said and done, I had a very rewarding experience, I managed to pair things, combo things, get a better score than the last time, but it's just too much. I'll also say that I drastically prefer this game at 2. Now, it's worth noting over on BGG, this is actually rated as best with 3. For me, I find Botoku, it can result in a lot of downtime because of how much things intertwine, how things are. I do find at 3, I found that the, the extra benefit I get from 3 versus the extra downtime, I prefer Botoku at 2, at least so far. Uh, maybe it comes down to players or who you're playing with and all that. And again, I only say that because I, this game is rated drastically best at 3 on BGG. Just for me personally, I drastically prefer it at 2. As far as things I can see others not liking, first of all, the iconography can be too much. The iconography doesn't actually bother me quite as much. I find there's a lot of cognitive loads the way things pair up, but iconography, by the, once you get, you know, the first round of the game, it starts to make a lot more sense and it starts to pair up nicely. It is overwhelming at first. It is messy, it is cluttered, there are times where it's not intuitive, there are times you have to double check the rules and stuff, but it's not the end of the world. But if you don't like iconography, this is a game that's chock full of iconography, left, right, and center. I'll also say that the rulebook is not the best, and again, I'm fine with that. I can get over a bad rulebook because once I know the game, I can teach the game. And for me, teaching the game is a whole lot faster than learning it. But I'll say this is a game that easily took me in the two-hour range to learn from the rulebook, and takes me about 15, maybe 20 minutes to teach. Not that 15, 20 minutes is a short teach, not by any means. And it's always true that a teach directly from a player versus a rulebook teach, there's always going to be a gap there. But I'll say that the gap in Botoku was definitely noticeable. The rulebook has information all present, but in a way that my first game of Botoku, the very first time I played it, involved a lot of cross checking the rules as I took an action and then went to the four things I didn't actually understand in the game. That's something that's not as big a deal when you're teaching it and it works fine, but I think the rulebook, the rulebook definitely gets in the way, so take that into account as you play it. I'll also say, speaking of rulebook and iconography, that there's a lot of terms in the game that can make this game additionally hard to learn from the rulebook. Hard from another player, but harder from the rulebook. Because you're learning so many terms. There's Iwakuru, there's Yokai, there's Pilgrim, there's Botoku, there's so much more. There's all these terms, and, and when you're trying to process what they are while holding up all this information in your head that isn't easy, it can be a lot. So, I guess my... Before we get to final thoughts, before we get to what the expansion adds, overall, Botoku is a game that I think is incredibly satisfying to play. It's a very good game, and it's very intricately... It's well done, it's promising. I am still excited to play it again. I'm just not excited to get somebody else to play it again, which kind of gets in the way, if that makes sense. As far as what the expansion adds, only positivity here. I think the expansion is just... I would. I mean, I would never play this game without the expansion, although I can understand why you might not want to. You see, the expansion adds a few new aspects. Uh, there's some small little details. First of all, it adds stickers. Stickers are charming. I haven't even stickered things yet, but it adds stickers for your various pieces. That's always a win. I don't, I don't really mind that either way. It adds a few new cards that can mix to your deck. Cards that have none of them over here. It has some few new cards into your deck. Cards that have different symbols in them. So you have cards that will be parts of two factions, which can be very rewarding for some of the euro card tiles. It all makes sense if you play the game, but some better cards, not better, more cards into your deck, which is a good thing. It also adds these tokens over here, which I think are a huge win. These tokens over here, as you play the game, we haven't, again, we haven't gotten into heavily, but as we play the game, there's going to be times you're moving this around the track, and in the base game, you're doing so for this tile here. Point scoring tiles. These are purely little races with the other players to get your tokens further up on the track to get more points. That's all you have in the base game. The expansion adds three new type of tiles that all give you a lot more variability to why you move up on those tracks and makes them a lot more interesting to compete and contend over. There's going to be point scoring tiles in the game that reward you for different things. There's going to be tiles that still reward you for being in first place, but also give you various benefits along the way. And then there's going to be tiles that just consistently give you points multiple times across the tile for the same thing. And all of those give you a lot more reason to not just pay attention to what those spots are and how to buy for them, it makes them matter more and also makes you pay more attention to what's happening in the tiles every single game and how to adjust around them. Honestly, the expansion recommends, you know, still keeping some of these in your games. Personally, I found that I almost always play at this point with just these extra tiles. I just find them far more interesting than just the point scoring tiles and I just, I like them more. And so the expansion over there already just makes the game more interesting. The downside is it does, once again, add another step of cognitive load. So uh, it's a pro for me, and at this point, with everything the game's doing, it's not going to scare me off, but I will say, technically, the po basic point scoring tiles are a little simpler, and the expansion tiles is adding just one more thing players have to pick up on, especially if it's your first game. 
But then the main thing the expansion adds, and the thing that for me is an absolute win in multiple counts, is this deck of cards. This deck of cards is going to give you a bunch of cards that can be earned in two ways. First of all, you'll start the game with two of them, but also you'll earn these cards by either whenever you draw one of these cards over here, and you ever whenever you keep one, you're going to be able to get not just get a card, but also draw a new card, which can be very helpful. We'll talk more about these cards shortly. But then also whenever you camp one of your pilgrims in one of these spots along the board, you're also going to get a card, giving you more of a reason to pay attention to those. And personally, I found that before the expansion came along, I was always more towards the gates. There's two types of tokens there. I'm not heavily getting into it, but there, of the two spots, I found I was more attracted to the other spot, but now you get an extra card when you go to the first spot, so now I'm even more torn between what to do. As far as what these cards do, there's two types of cards over here. The first kind is going to help you, and the second time is going to hurt your opponent, and they are nicely color-coded, so you can remove. If you want a little less interaction in your games, you can remove all the red ones over here, but these cards just give you extra things you can do. They're just small little extra perks, and there's just a ton of them. There's a ton of these text-based cards, all giving you just different rules of, like, when you do this, do this instead. The next time you grab a crystal, instead go into the stack and select a crystal. The next time you build a building, go ahead and take control of your opponent's building instead, or sure, control, technically speaking. They'll give you all these different things you can do in specific situations that just free up the game in a certain way. And I think they're almost exclusively a good thing that I would include in every game with the caveat that they do introduce a degree of luck. There are times you draw a card and it's perfect for the situation, but there are also times you draw a card and it's just a dead card that's not going to help you. And they're only worth half a point to them the game, which makes them kind of like, I mean, I guess I don't have to play this, but half a point just doesn't feel worth it. So I overall love the cards and would never play without them, but it does introduce another degree of luck to an otherwise incredibly strategic game because some cards are more or less helpful. And I, I wish there was more of a way or opportunity to trade those cards in, either worth more points or to be able to cycle cards to draw new cards because when they help you, they're just an incredibly satisfying addition to the game. When they hurt your opponent, that's take it or leave it. Again, you can choose to just ignore those cards or remove them from the game entirely. And when they're just a dead card in your hand, I mean, I guess half a point is still half a point. But so overall, the expansion just adds things that I like. Again, I do think those cards slightly move a drop away from Euro and a drop more into some luck elements. But for me, I would never play without them. I just find them more fun, more engaging, and something else to consider and balance around as I try to play through the game. Which brings me to final thoughts on Matoku. And if you have no idea what I'm going to score this game, that makes sense. I mean, I know I know what the score is, but only because I, I sat through it and thought it out. But for me, Batoku is a 3.5 out of 5. And that feels, that feels unfair. The game is incredibly intricate. The game is incredibly well done. The game is incredibly satisfying. And it's not even that long. It's sometimes I play a Euro game that, you know, I, I just think, oh, you know, I didn't need to play a four hour long game to get the same experience I can get out of... Coimbra in, you know, an hour and a half. And that's not the issue with Botoku. Botoku plays at a reasonable length, and I think that I find it satisfying, and I, I want to continue playing it. The problem I have with Botoku is I don't want to teach new players. I just don't want to loot new people into the game. That means that it's a game that I'll only pick out with specific people, and the mental load versus the cognitive payoff, all those things, it is a very good, very satisfying game that I do recommend. If you do like the game, I highly recommend the expansion. I think it's just a good addition to the game in general. That... It just gives me more things to consider. I really like these tiles over here, and I really like this deck of cards over here. I think they are just good additions to the game. And so, Batoku for me, it's, if I'm judging this by mechanics alone, it's a 4 at least at the bare minimum, possibly even a 4.5. But I still have to take into account the whole package, and the whole package of Botoku is a game that has too much going on relative to the payoff that the game gives when I'm considering this versus other games. So it's both a game that I appreciate, have enjoyed, and sort of recommend if none of the things I've said scare you off. But if I was just giving recommendations, I'd probably choose other Euro games instead that have the same payoff without the same upfront cost. So Botoku, a 3.5 out of 5, although one that I wish I was rating a bit higher. As far as other game recommendations, first of all, if you're looking for a game that gives me the same feeling of Botoku and the amount you're juggling and the amount going on, but with a much simpler framework, I think Encyclopedia from Holy Grail Games is still a fantastic game, one of my favorite Euro games in this genre, and just has so much less going on, yet being equally rewarding in the turns you take. And if you're looking for another recent card-driven Euro game, card-driven dice, all that stuff, is it dice? There's no dice. Another card-driven Euro game that I've really been enjoying that, again, gives you a lot of interweaving mechanisms as you try to struggle. A game that almost seems as complex when you're looking at it. It seems overwhelming. It seems complex, but I find the rules teach to be much, much smoother. Revive from a Porta Games is definitely one of my new favorite Euro games in the genre that gives me the, the chaining and comboing satisfaction that I get from Botoku, but in a much simpler to ramp people up on gameplay. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this review helpful, and as always, I hope you have a good one.